Greetings. Thank you for tuning in to this 2020 General Election Candidate Forum for Thurston County Superior Court, Position 8. The forum is presented by the League of Women Voters of Thurston County, along with Thurston Community Media. This forum is being held electronically due to COVID-19. Candidates, moderators, and timers are all joining in on Zoom links with the help of TC Media. A bit about the League. The League is a nonprofit organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in their government. The League neither supports nor, nor opposes candidates of parties. We are nonpartisan. The League registers new voters, studies issues, and advocates for its positions with the legislature and other governmental bodies. Despite its name, the legal is open to everyone age 16 and up. I'm Susan Fixdell from the League, and I'll be moder moderating this forum. A timer will show a sign when you have 30 seconds left, and then again when you need to stop. The candidates for this position are Scott Alf and Sharonda Anomilo. For this forum, candidates will each have the opportunity to answer a series of questions in alternating order. Some of the questions have been contributed by the Asian Pacific Islanders Coalition South Puget Sound Chapter. For the following questions, the first respondent will have two minutes and the second will have one minute to respond. I will alternate questions between candidates so that the first responses are alternated also. Scott Alf, what might you do as a Superior Court judge to improve access for all citizens to the justice system? You have two minutes. Sure, thank you. And so yeah, I've, I've been a judge for the past 15 years and I've had to make that uh, judge in the city of Olympia for the past 15 years. And making decisions and making access to justice for, for all citizens is important. I'm currently co-chairing the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force for the state of Washington, and so for the state of Washington courts. And through that process, we are, we're making sure that everything that we do has to do with access to justice. And so we wanna make sure that, that because right now, as, as all of us are going through this, this COVID-19 and we're doing Zoom hearings, they're doing Zoom hearings in court, like we're doing this Zoom meeting today, it's that we need to make sure that everybody that's going to be attending those Zoom hearings has an opportunity to do so. And so with, with my court in the city of Olympia, we've created, we're creating a kiosk that we can have people that do not have access to be able to come into the courthouse and be able to, to either come in in person or be able to go meet with their attorney by using that kiosk, which has a video component. Uh, we've also created in our court, we've, we have an OWL device that is a device that, that shows everybody in the courtroom with the video camera. And also, so people, we do, most of the people that we're addressing in our court system now are appearing via Zoom. And so we do have some that do not have that access. And so they appear in person. And so we, we have to allow that. So we also, we need to make sure that, that we have a, a large homeless population in our county, and we have to make sure that, that those individuals have the ability to be able to be heard as well. And so, but so thank you. I, I know uh, I've used my time. Thank you. Um, the next, the same question for Sharonda Amamila. What might you do as a Superior Court judge to improve access for all citizens to the justice system? Thank One you. minute. One minute. Thank you. Um, I've already started the process before I left the Thurston County um, Public Defender's Office by volunteering to serve on Thurston County's Superior Court's Self-Represented Parties Committee, um, which was being headed by Judge Hirsch at the time. It's my understanding and follow-up that that committee still needs to continue to work to access uh, to assess access to justice issues for self-represented parties. I've also understood that it's not just the folks who are self-represented, but also civil cases where they do need an opportunity to address the backlog of cases. And so the backlog of cases um, could be addressed by expanding the non-court processes uh, through arbitration and mediation. So I look forward to being part of those processes in the Thurston County Superior Court. Thank you. Now, Sharonda Amamino, um, are there any specific types of cases in which you know now that you will need to disqualify yourself? You have two minutes. Um, not necessarily types of cases, but, but parties. Um, with 12 years on the uh, public defenders, uh, in the public defender's office um, and becoming supervisor of the dependency and adolescent unit, 
Um, I really know a lot of the families that would be involved in the child welfare cases, um, as well as some of the families who might have ongoing cases with the uh, juvenile that might be on juvenile probation. So those are, those are the only cases that I can see where I might know a prior party. But in terms of a type of case, mm -hmm. being a Superior Court litigator for the last 17 years in the Thurston County Superior Court, I have... Um, represented people in all types of cases and been involved in all types of cases. And I don't have a conflict with any particular type of case that I'm aware of. Just it may be that I might have a conflict with a party. Thank you. And Scott L. Sure. The, the only type of cases that I think I would have an issue with is the cases that were appealed from the from the Olympia Municipal Court since I've been the judge there for so long. And so and initially, and so the cases that I had heard. But after that, uh, I've kind of prided myself on, on trying to remain impartial in the community. I do, ha I, but I did grow up here. And so there are gonna be parties that I know. And so when there are parties I know, then I will have to recuse myself in the case. And I have had to do that over the years. Thank you. Scott Alf, the next question. In addition to judicial officers courtroom role, they must also involve themselves in the administration of the court as a functioning branch of government. What challenges do you see both among other judges and with the executive and legislative offices in carrying out these administrative functions? You have two minutes. Sure, and I've, I've been, as the Olympia, only Olympia Municipal Court judge, I'm the presiding judge in Olympia. And so I have to deal with the, all those issues. And so we work together. In fact, yesterday I had a, a meeting with the, the chief justice and several judges, presiding judges around the, the division two uh, court of appeals area on, on specifically that and on dealing with the things that we're dealing with, like dealing with the, uh, the cameras in the courtroom that we have to deal with now that we didn't have to in the past. You know, staffing, you know, you have to hire and, and maintain staff and make sure that the staff is following the, the rules of law and that, they're, that they are maintaining their independence. And so we have to continue to do that. Uh, as the president of the District and Municipal Court Judges Association, I've worked with judges all over the state on these type of things, uh, I've also uh, worked you know, as a as an administrator with uh, with my court. Uh, we have a court, great court administrator in my court, and we work as a team to make sure that we get the things done that we need to get done. And it's it's very important uh, to also be able to work with your your city council, to work or your county council, and with the other branches of government because you are going to have issues that come up that need to be addressed. Uh, we've had. Uh, with our community court in the city of Olympia, we had to get funding from the, the city council to be able to go forward and work with them. So we have to be, you have to be able to work with them. And as the presiding judge, you have to be able to, to work with all individuals in the court system and the, and the justice system as a whole. Thank you. Ms. Sharonda Amamilo, in addition to judicial officers courtroom role, they must also involve themselves in the administration of the court as a functioning branch of government. What challenges do you see both among other judges and uh, with the executive and legislative offices in carrying out these administrative functions? You have one minute. Thank you. As most other judges, we each have our own departments. There are eight different departments and the position that I am presenting myself for is department number eight. Um, and those different departments will have to work together in order to uh, maximize the best use of the resources that are available to the court. And outside of that, in my five years as a supervisor on the management team of this, the public defender's office, we had to work with the other stakeholders, law enforcement, corrections, um, prosecution, sometimes even public health in order to meet the needs of the clients, as well as to um, serve the community. Um, other challenges are resources, space, and staffing. Some of the things that Scott has used is like all of the programs that you want to get done and all of the strategic plans that you want to try and accomplish. My 25 years in the military, I'm very well versed in strategic planning and setting goals to meet uh, an object, the, a series of objectives with competing priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Now, next question. Sharonda Mamilo. If you observed a party in your courtroom being poorly represented by an unprepared or ineffective lawyer, how would you handle the situation? You have two minutes. Um, generally, if a court is uh, paying attention to that sort of thing, they will uh, stop the proceedings and ask counsel and or the person, the defendant or the client of that uh, 
attorney if they need a recess, if they need a recess to go and have a private conversation. If it appears that uh, their communication has broken down and uh, the person's constitutional rights are at risk of being violated, then the court has a discretion to uh, set the matter over for either later that day or reset it at another time when the matter appears to be more ready to make sure the rights of the person are adequately represented. So that is one of the things that um, I would do as a judge because my first um, responsibility is to make sure that the law is carried out appropriately in the courtroom, but as well as everyone's rights are protected equally and um, without any sort of uh, prejudice uh, towards anyone, no matter what party they are. Thank you. And Scott Alf, uh, if you observed a party in your courtroom being poorly represented by an unprepared or ineffective lawyer, how would you handle the situation? So in a criminal matter, the, the accused has the right to effective assistance of counsel. So it's not just the right to counsel, it's the right to effective assistance of counsel. And so if you're in a preliminary matter, you then you set the case over, allow, make sure that you indicate that you find that there are some discrepancies some some things that need to be addressed and you set that case over and can address it later. When you're in trial, it's more difficult. You know, there's going to, because there's, there are specific reasons that an attorney is going to make decisions on how they want to proceed with the trial. And sometimes you have to be able to, to notice that and understand what's going on. But the effective assistance of counsel is a paramount um, requirement of the law. And so that's something that you do have to, as a judge, make sure that that is occurring. Thank you. Next question. Scott Elf, what criteria would you use for deciding whether to imp impose or affirm sentences outside of standard ranges? You have two minutes. Sure. And so there's many factors that you have to take into consideration if you're going to go outside of a, of a standard sentence or a range of sentencing under the Sentencing Reform Act. And so you have to make sure that you're making those specific findings to be able to do so. So you can't just say, I want to make this decision that I want to go outside of the, of the sentencing guidelines because I think it's a good idea. You know, there has to be specific findings that you make to be able to do that. And so you, there has to be aggra aggravating factors to, to impose a sentence above the sentencing guidelines, and there has to be mitigating factors to uh, impose something below the sentencing guidelines. And so those are something that you have to take into consideration. And as a judge, you have to be able to use your discretion to make those decisions and be able to make the decisions appropriately. And so as I've been a judge, I've, I don't, at this point with the municipal court level, I do not have to fall. There is no uh, Sentencing Reform Act for municipal court cases. So every case has, a, has, I have to use my discretion on whether to impose up to a year in jail. And so you have to use that discretion as throughout your decision-making process. And so you have to continue to do that and you have to make sure that you're following the, the correct law and the factors. Thank you. And Sharonda and Anilo, what criteria would you use for deciding whether to impose or affirm sentences outside of standard range? Not only are, do we have sentencing guidelines for the adult system, we also have dispositional guidelines, which are the equivalent of sentencing guidelines in the juvenile system. And so Scott is correct when he mentions that there are criteria for identifying when you are going above the range or below the range um, that is written out in the disposition or the sentencing guidelines. But there are also alternatives to sentencing. Um, once you've determined that a person has aggravating factors, then again, you state the criteria, following the criteria outlined in the statute and in case law, you impose those. If it's below the same difference, you have to make specific findings. But there are also alternatives, and the parties are making recommendations to the judge. So there are alternatives to incarceration altogether, other programming that are outside of the sentencing uh, ranges if it's applicable to a certain type of crime, because not all crimes are eligible for alternatives to incarceration. So those are the things that are taken into consideration. Thank you. And again, Sharonda Anamilo for the last or the next to the last question. You now have the opportunity to ask the other candidate a question, and you will have time for a one-minute response. Thank you very much, um, Judge Alf. Um, I'm really interested in learning about uh, within the last one year. How many trials uh, have you presided over in uh, the city of Olympia Municipal Court? 
and um, what types of cases were, were those? Sure, and I've, I've presided over probably three or four different trials over the last year, and they are typically our trials are going to be domestic violence related offenses or DUIs. Uh, for the last year, the cases I've presided over were pr primarily uh, domestic violence related offenses. Um, also, uh, I had a trial where an individual was charged with um, with assault of a, of a juvenile um, that was with sexual motivation. And so that was one of the jury trials that I had to preside over. I've presided over um, hundreds of, or probably or probably a hundred cases over the years of, as a in jury trials, but in the last year, probably four to five. And I've also, as a, as an attorney, I've taken cases to trial um, as a, as a prosecutor, I was a prosecutor and attorney and took several cases to trial that way as well. So I had that experience. Also dealing with juries, um, making sure that they understand the process, making sure that, that the accused has all of their rights reserved. Thank you. Thank you. And now Sharonda, you have one minute to respond to your own question. Oh. If you, if you like. Oh, sure. Um, as a litigator uh, in the Superior Court, I have had a number of trials. Uh, and uh, in the last year, those trials were bench trials. They were juvenile offender trials and uh, termination of parental rights trials, as well as uh, initial dependency fact findings. And in those trials, there, those are the termination trials and the uh, dependency trials are complex civil litigation trials, really. There's volumes and volumes of evidence and many, many witnesses, and it, it's a, there's a lot of complex issues to get through when you're talking about some depriving someone of their fundamental right to the care, custody, and control of their children. As well as with juveniles, there's a lot of he say, she say, a lot of, you know, back and forth. And so there's a lot to parse through in terms of trying to get to the truth as well as trying to get to the right outcome for this youth so that you are staying aware of the impact of them on them, um, dependent on their um, developmental stage, especially the brain development stage when you're dealing with mental health issues. Thank you. Thank you. And now Scott Alf, you have the opportunity to ask the other candidate a question and you will have one minute, or I'm sorry, you will have time for a one minute response. So, as a judge, you're going to get times where you have individuals that are that are in distress and people that are going to treat you with disrespect. And so, you're going to have a case where somebody's going to be say nasty things to you or about you. you know? And so, how would you respond to somebody that does that? Thank you, Scott. Um, I've had that happen a lot as a public defender. <laughs> Um, and but one of the things is I always recognize that the person is before the court, not based on something that anyone in the court did to them. So recognizing that that might be a trauma response because they're feeling that something is happening to them that they have no control over and they're in defensive posture and having a recognition of that would allow me to um, be able to try and engage them enough as long as they're not becoming violent and needing to be removed. I'm trying to engage them enough to give them, to show them the, the respect that I want to know what it is that's triggering them so that I can help them get heard, make sure they're heard and they get the representation and outcome that's best for them. And so I won't take it personally because I know that I didn't do anything to that person that's causing the distress that brought them to the court in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott, would you like to give a one minute response to that same question? Sure. So when you're when you're dealing with people, the, and they are going to be in distress and people come to court. Uh, and as I say, lots of times when I'm in court, you know, I'm here every day and this is not something that you're here every day. And I get that. And so we have to make sure that we're treating you with respect, but also let them know that they have to treat the court with respect because you have sometimes we'll have a full courtroom where we have, you know, right now we don't because of the virus. But in the past, we've had 100 people in the courtroom before. And so if you have one person that's disruptive, you have to be able to take control of that situation. And though, so you, uh, you have contempt power as a judge. And my 15 years, I've imposed contempt three times and nothing in the last 10 years. And so it's just, it's really trying to work with people on how to make sure that they understand that their behavior is not appropriate 
And then you have to give them an opportunity to be heard. And be, if you're going to hold somebody in contempt, you have to give them right to counsel and have them give them an opportunity to apologize. And for the most part, they will apologize after after they think about it and you give them an opportunity to say, well, I don't know what I was thinking when I said that to you, Judge. And a lot of times it's because they're under the influence when they're after they just coming off the high. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and now uh, you have a chance to give a closing statement. And in that statement, please explain your vision for the Supreme Court. I'm sorry, for the Superior Court. <laughs> a vision for uh, the Supreme Court too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could maybe work that in. Scott L. How much time? You have two minutes, sorry. All right, thank you. And so, once again, my name's Scott Alf, and I'm currently the Olympia Municipal Court Judge. I've been the judge in Olympia for the last 15 years, and I'm running for Thurston County Superior Court because I think I have the qualities and the background to make me a good Superior Court Judge. And so I, I'm really looking forward to that opportunity. I was born and raised in Thurston County. I graduated from Timberline High School, and I've spent my entire legal career working in our community. I've, I've As I indicated before, I've been the judge in the Olympia Municipal Court for the last 15 years. I've past president of the District and Municipal Court Judges Association. I'm past president of the Lacey Rotary Club and a board member of the North Thurston Education Foundation. And you have to take all those things into consider the you know, life learned uh, lessons of, in life. You've learned and things that you can take onto the bench because you can't just come in blind when you're coming onto the bench. You've got to be able to be able to make tough decisions and life lessons are a way to make those tough decisions. And so, like I said, I've been the judge for so long that I've been able to make those tough decisions over the years and I will continue to do that. I've created in the Olympia Municipal Court, the Olympia Community Court. It's a therapeutic court program that works with the individuals on, the, on their specific needs. And so rather than taking the individual um, as a number, we treat them as a person. We treat them we have them do chemical dependency treatment. We have them do uh, mental health treatment. We have 15, 15, 16 different providers that come in every Wednesday morning to work with our community court on getting, on getting better. And so I, I hope to work with the, with the drug court in Thurston County Superior Court. And I know that that's a, that's a tough position to get because that's a, a well sought out and a position that most judges would like to have. But it's, it's very important to me that you're gonna work with individuals on helping them to to get better and to be the people that they want to be in life. And so I, I look forward to doing that. I look forward to making the tough decisions that I've had to make for the last 15 years. And I want to I want to do that at the superior court level. So I appreciate, appreciate your time again today. And thank you again for having me and really look forward to, to working with you. And I hope for you to get your vote. Thank you. And now um, Sharonda Anamila, you have the opportunity to make a closing uh, statement. And in that statement, please explain your vision for the Superior Court. You have two minutes. Thank you. Um, I am Sharonda Mamilo, and I'm running for position eight for Thurston County Superior Court, where I've practiced as a litigator for the past 17 years, representing parents and adolescents and sometimes youth uh, themselves in child welfare cases, as well as adults and youth in um, juvenile offender cases uh, or criminal cases. I've also represented people who are in mental health crisis and involuntary commitment courts. And we have to help, as a litigator, we have to help our clients get access to all of the types of services that they would need to stabilize their lives or get their lives back on track. I'm also a 25-year military veteran. I'm currently still serving the United States Army Reserves. I mean, I've been around the world and back again, but in the past 29 years, I've lived here in Washington State. And as I said, 17 years as a litigator here in Thurston County Superior Court. I have very deep connections in the community with your service provider agencies that um, look after the community welfare. I also worked uh, with the Washington Trafficking Prevention to, to try and prevent um, commercially sexual exploitation. I think it's very important that you have someone who understands the needs of veterans. I've represented veterans. Um, the community is growing and very much impacted by the veteran population. And I just look forward to bringing all of that experience as a mother and a wife and, a, and an attorney uh, with a broad base of experience um, to the court to help the current judges uh, meet the goals and objectives that they've established. They have a dynamic court. You have a dynamic court. It's a general practice court. And that court uh, represents a lot of the issues that impact everyone around the state. And I think my diversity of background, experience, 
and 15 and 17 years as a litigator in the Thurston County Superior Court gives me what I need to hit the ground running um, to address the issues that they faced in the past and to be ready for the issues that they face now going forward with the changes from COVID-19. Thank you very much for your time and your interest. I think it's very important that the voters be informed and thank you, League of Women Voters. Thank you. Thank you, Sharonda Mamilo and Scott Al for participating in this forum. We thank the Thurston Community Media for producing the forum and the Asian Pacific Islanders Coalition for its contributions. The forum will be available on the TC Media channels on the League website and on YouTube shortly after the forums are concluded. We're glad you have taken the opportunity to view this forum. We, we remind you to vote in the general election beginning October 16th, 2020 and closing November 3rd, 2020. Thank <music> you.